Greetings, everybody. Peter Maravellis here on behalf of City Lights Booksellers and Publishers. I'd like to welcome you to session four of the week-long festival titled Revisions, Decoding Technological Bias. Over the course of the next few days, the festival will present numerous lectures, discussions, and workshops focusing on the ways in which technological bias shapes our cultural realities. A network of activists, educators, critical theorists, designers, and programmers will come together to share new perspectives and develop new visions advocating for social justice and reclaiming power. Before we begin, I would like to bring attention to the good work of our partners and co-producers in this week's endeavor. City Lights is honored to be working alongside the Goethe Institute San Francisco and Gray Area in helping you bring this kind of amazing, remarkable program to light. Goethe Institute San Francisco is the cultural arm of the Federal Republic of Germany. Their uh, programs encourage intercultural dialogue and enable cultural involvement. They aim to strengthen and develop the development of structures in civil society and foster worldwide mobility. It is a great pleasure to be working once again with Bettina Wudianka and her colleagues and bringing you this really exciting program. I'd also like to extend my gratitude to our friends at Gray Area, our fellow co-producers in this festival. Gray Area is a cultural center and educational hub located in San Francisco's Mission District. Their mission is to apply art and technology to create social and civic impact through education, incubation, and public events. They use digital tools to create art and design projects that benefit society. I'd like to take this moment to thank Nadav Hockman and his colleagues at Gray Area for all their good work. It's been a pleasure and an honor to be working with them on this fantastic project. So this session today is titled Surrogate Futures, Technology, Race, and the Human. It is being presented by Nita Atanasowski and Kalindi Vora. Uh, Nita Atanasowski is Professor of Feminist Studies and Critical Race and Ethnic Studies at the University of California at Santa Cruz and author of Humanitarian Violence, the U.S. Deployment of Diversity from University of Minnesota Press. Kalindi Vora is Professor of Gender, Sexuality, and Women's Studies at the University of California at Davis and author of Life Support, Biocapital, and the New History of Outsourced Labor, published also by University of Minnesota. Together, they are the authors of the book, Surrogate Humanity, Race, Robots, and the Politics of Technological Futures, published by Duke University Press. We will be posting links with which you may purchase this and other books by them in the chat function of your Zoom dashboard. Their presentation is gonna be followed by a Q&A, so please do post your questions and comments in the Q&A window of your dashboard. So, uh, Nita Tanasowski, Kalindi Vora, it is great to see you once again. Thanks for joining us and welcome to the festival. We're so glad you could really be part of this. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here with us. Um, Nita, did you want to say hello before we get started? Yes, just to thank Peter for the introduction and um, to say how happy we are to be here. And we wanted to thank City Lights, Gray Matter, and the Goethe Institute for inviting us to this really exciting week-long event on technological bias. Um, so I will go ahead and get started. I'm going to talk about our book, Surrogate Humanity. And um, I'm going to think about some of the examples from that book in the context of a longer history of labor. and its reproduction of society, um, both of which we think we see as at stake in uh, contemporary technologies, specifically in the design imaginaries that are behind their development. So I think by now it's probably obvious to most of us that as long as big business, which we know profits on depreciated labor costs, as long as big business continues to fund the development of technology, there's not gonna be a goal among those most resource designers to reduce human labor toil. Rather, the goal will continue to be to imagine more technologies that are better at exploiting human labor. So I wanted to start by showing a few examples of how gender and race have long been tools to extract and exploit human labor on a global scale. And this is since at least the economy of Atlantic chattel slavery and how that history informs technology development now. So this is one way that we can sort of expand a conversation about bias into thinking about other ways that 
um, race has informed the development of technology. Then I'm going to share two key concepts from our book, Surrogate Humanity, that can help explain how this history connects to technology design today. Those concepts are techno-liberalism, which we use to describe what we call an updated form of liberalism that understands the subject of free will, the liberal subject, um, and the future of human potential through technology. And the other is what we call the surrogate effect. That is how technology support this subject's experience of that freedom in ways that are threaded through with the long history of, of race and exploitation. So throughout, I'm gonna kind of give examples and ask us how to consider how these arguments can inflect this week long conversation about technology and bias. And along the way, I'll show some examples that also illustrate this, that illustrates the stakes of actually intervening in the imaginaries behind um, the development of new technologies as I as we see them. So I'm going to share some slides with you. So mainly what I want to do with you all today is open up and, and NATO will continue with this open up the idea that bias is just one of the many trains on which we need to counter histories of racial and gender injustice that get incorporated into technology infrastructure and the practices we um, do with that technology specifically through the ways that imaginations of technology designers become caught up in inadvertently sometimes in advancing those histories of exploitation. So technologies of labor distribution have built the racializing and gendering of labor into labor technology infrastructure. So this has long been a way to artificially cheapen labor. I'm going to start with this map of the maritime route, routes of ships who were moving enslaved Africans captured and dislocated by force to Europe and the Americas. And the main technology of distribution were at this point was ships and shipping routes, which are represented here by red arrows. Now compare this to a map of contemporary submarine cables. So these are fiber optic cables that are currently moving labor as data around the globe. So for those of you who don't know, the first transatlantic cables were laid in the 1960s. Um, they were very low bandwidth and Trans-Pacific cables followed in the early 1900s. And by the early 1900s, the British Empire had connected up most of the continents. The similarity between the two maps marks the way that the flows of labor and capital today build upon the logics, relationships, and material infrastructures of the colonial period. And this sets the stage for later the map that will underpin globalization and now even the so-called casualization of labor. So this picture and article is from 2007, and the article discusses the outsourcing of household work here, tutoring. And I know this picture has a different resonance right now when many of us are or have been working in context like the subject of this photo. But at that time, 2007, it, it served to show how outsourcing by US and European corporations was using um, foreign workers to artificially lower their labor costs. And part of the reason that labor was cheaper in the places where outsourced work was being sent was that those companies didn't have to pay any benefits for their workers. So I use this story and others like it to connect that long history, uh, or sorry, to connect the logic of outsourcing to that and to the logic of automation and platform labor-based distribution apps, which is my next example. So at this time of this picture, um, 2007, a couple of years later, we first started getting some data from what was then the relatively new platform Amazon Mechanical Turk. Let me show you a slide of that. So here is a 2010 snapshot of self-reported data by Amazon Mechanical Turk workers. So for those of you who don't know, this is a crowdsourced labor platform where employers can go and task out work and employees who call themselves trickers can pick up those tasks for um, specific amounts of pay. And this um, article by Ross Zaldivar, Iranian Tomlinson is dated now, but it's interesting because it shows you 
that the original sort of imagination behind Amazon Mechanical Turk builds on the logic of outsourcing. You'll see that here the majority of workers were Indian at the time and with a slight majority being female. So there's an idea of um, building on those previous structures of racialized and gendered labor. So the point of bringing together these examples is to argue that technology as it stands now is not likely to ever be developed at a scale that gives workers more resources in exchange for less labor as long as it's owned and designed by big tech. So there is a misplaced belief that big tech can bring less labor and more freedom to workers. This is a belief that's part of what Nada and I call techno-liberalism in our book. The idea that we humans will be liberated by technology while simultaneously maintaining the same capitalist system of labor and the market as it stands. And so, you know, if you think back to even the first kind of um, literary or um, scholarly anti-capitalist um, philosophy, the communist utopia sketched by Marx and Engels, there, when they imagined a revolutionary overthrow of the capitalist system, it would include workers taking over the machines of capitalist production. So the technologies of the factory floor would no longer be designed and used to extract profits from the bodies of workers, but instead to produce the everyday commodities they themselves needed. Only then could a new system of communalizing resources, including technology, be put into place. So in the updated techno-liberal view of technology, individuals, each of us a consumer and producer, acquire and use new technologies like 3D printers or um, task sharing apps as part of a distributed factory across households. And these new technologies, like sharing platforms, are still designed and produced and owned by large tech companies for their own profit. So the liberal subject is free to choose to consume technology and become a node in the production line, now knitted together through our privately owned vehicles or our privately owned home technologies. So you can see the failure of one failure of imagination there. And in our book, Surrogate Humanity, we also use the concept of the surrogate effect of technologies to think through shifts in the race and gender politics of labor as they come up in emerging tech. So we start the book by thinking alongside um, a book by the historian City Hartman. That book's called Scenes of Subjection, and it discusses the concept, she discusses the concept of the surrogate in the context of US chattel slavery. And Hartman brings up the novelist Toni Morrison's formulations of slaves as, quote, surrogate selves for the meditation on the problems of human freedom. So when we talk about the surrogate effect, we see um, technologies acting like an, a mirror or an imaginative surface for understanding our own freedom. And we understand that freedom as a domination of another who is made to be unfree. And we can talk more about this through examples. But our research has found that this surrogate effect, when that mirror is a technology that shows us that we are more human and more free in comparison, that surrogate effect can delimit what counts as work, what counts as violence, exploitation, even what counts as a valued social relation, because it defines who counts as recognizably free and fully human. So I think labor technology is one place where this techno-liberal imaginary shows itself clearly. And another one, not surprisingly, is in space exploration. So I was first made aware of this NASA project called MiceHab by Maya Cruz, who's a PhD candidate at UC Davis, and Maya studies colonial history, the colonial histories behind interplanetary exploration. So when I found out about this project a few years ago, I, um, I was really interested because I saw some patterns I recognized. So the story of MiceHab is that in July 2016, a team of multidisciplinary scientists and aerospace engineers at NASA's Langley Research Center published this concept paper, which I have a picture of on my slide. So it proposed a sub it proposed a study to look at the potential for human reproduction on Mars, and it's called 
the multi-generational independent colony for extraterrestrial habitation, autonomy, and behavior, or mice have. So they haven't built this yet, but in the concept description, the short-term goal of the experiment is to send a mouse colony into orbit, Earth orbit, and study how spaceflight and partial gravity impact the health and birth rates of these mice over three generations. So this um, unit, this habitation unit, would have 600 cameras that observe the mouse colony, and their care would be the responsibility of telerobots in the, ha the habitat, and these would be controlled on Earth by telerobots. They would be telerobots controlled on Earth. So the video that goes with this concept paper, which I'm going to show you in just a little bit in just a sec, compares this experiment to the Lewis and Clark expedition because it's designed to scout for the possibility of establishing a human based version for a Mars colony. So let me just show you a tiny bit of the project so you can see what you think. NASA is currently designing approaches to explore Mars with an emphasis on a pioneering approach similar to the Lewis and Clark expedition, where we set forth to expand human presence in the solar system. In the spacecraft will be designed to support the growth of a large mouse colony for year-long durations, studying reproduction and maturation of mice over multiple generations. The interior consists of multiple levels of specially designed mouse enclosures, which can be removed from the main cylindrical structure for cleaning and maintenance. The colony maintenance robot housed on the center adjustable platform services the enclosures. The habitat is designed to autonomously support the mice throughout their life cycle, including food, water, waste management, and medical care. Mice can be selectively bred to create generations which have only lived in partial gravity while preventing overbreeding. These future generations can be observed to understand mammalian reproductive challenges, physiological changes, and altered behavioral characteristics. This facility can also address other human exploration research goals, including collecting data on how the radiation in deep space affects human health. The systems on board the facility will also be tested to benefit the development of human systems, including demonstration of autonomous robotic maintenance and long duration operations in a deep space environment. So there's a lot to say about this video, and I'm interested to hear what the audience thinks, but a few things I want to note are that this reproduction through generations of mice is a time-tested structure for lab studies of genetic and epigenetic change. So that's not shocking or surprising. And what I wanted to point out is that because this is in the concept in the context of potential space exploration and the mice here are stand-ins for humans, we can think of the history of genetics here like we saw with the map of the shipping routes of the Atlantic slave trade. So in this model, this mice have model for human futurity embodied by these mice, um, the idea is to leave a dying planet and reproduce life elsewhere, bringing the same um, sort of historical econ economies of colonialism and chattel slavery that are built into the history of human reproducing humans as um, workers as commodities so on the one hand we have nasa talking about the sort of patenting of innovative knowledge um, but we've seen over and over again that the sort of innovation here is always to exploit the undervalued and often invisible reproductivity of humans and here other organisms so that human reproduction, a future built on human reproduction becomes the grounds for creating technologies to make that reproduction profitable. And, um, you know, we also have to think about how the technology here we're talking about um, depends on genetics whose early origins were, of course, in eugenics and 
think about how that history plays out here, maybe something we can discuss in the Q&A. So for me, the Mice Hub project imagines a continuation of the logic of humans as self-reproducing capital, which is an inheritance from slavery and indenture. And it takes that history and projects it into a future technological imaginary. So what then might imaginaries of the future that reject this kind of futurity, reject this techno-liberal imagination of the future um, come up with? What other forms of socializing, of taking care of one another, of being interrelated might we come up with? So I wanted to share a couple of projects I've been involved in since Nada and I completed our book, Surrogate Humanity. I've actually, I was inspired by this research to really try to impact STEM fields and technology design directly. And um, for the most part, this has meant participating in social change oriented STEM projects by, collab by kind of forming collaborations or being parts of collaborations between people who are experts in feminist research and ethnic and community histories together with technical experts. So just a little brief example or two. So this image is from a project I've been involved in in three years funded by the National Science Foundation. And I've been doing this project with Dr. Sarah McCullough at UC Davis. And what we've been doing is developing new curricula for STEM researchers at the PhD level with the goal that they should be able to incorporate knowledge of historical injustice and exclusions into their research design and practice. So here's an image of um, some of our participants' um, vision of what is a challenge to science, to feminist science, to social justice science. And then this slide is uh, an encapsulation of what they actually would like to see, the visions of what science can be with a social justice commitment. So we've been developing and testing this curriculum. It's been successful in many ways. Um, and it uses the insights of the field of feminist science and technology studies, also ethnic studies, research to train PhD students in STEM fields to consider the histories like the ones I've shared today with you and do this while they're imagining what kind of technologies we can build to enable a different future rather than taking for granted the kind of inertia and infrastructure that was built before. So to mention another example, I've been working with a group of social scientists from across California who also study science and technology and collaborate with scientists in their work. And we've co-written what we're calling a pocket guide to feminist science. And whereas that NSF, the National Science Foundation funded project to intervene in STEM curriculum um, wants to train STEM researchers and feminist approaches, the pocket guide is meant to be kind of used in the field. So it's a short introduction to the problems of non-feminist approaches to science and provides some entry level tools and it's the tone is meant to be kind of light and fun. So a variety of people can pick it up and be engaged. So that's to just end on the kind of positive forward looking note. I'm looking forward to talking more about these ideas in our discussion. And for now, I will turn it over to Nada. Thanks so much, Quindy. Um, so in this second part of our presentation, like Kalindi, I'm going to extend um, some of what we were working on in surrogate humanity on some of the concepts that we developed and turn to a couple of new examples um, and speak about um, the topic at hand, um, technological bias uh, in relation to these new example. So in particular, I'm going to be thinking about um, several feminist approaches to ethics and technology and proposals um, for correcting gendered bias and racial bias in the field of robotics. Um, so the first um, of these strands um, looks at the law. And so there have been a number of groups working to ban certain technologies um, as being inherently unethical or leading to inherently unethical relations. And I want to talk about um, why I think that approach can be limiting um, and to think about the law itself um, as having historically been a mechanism of um, exclusion and in some instances leading to, um, um, to violence itself. 
And then secondly, I want to think about calls to diversify both the tech industry and humanoid robots um, and to think about um, uh, similarly some of the limitations of, of that approach that replicates a kind of easy multicultural solution um, to a much more complex problem. And then I want to, um, like Kalindi, end on a more hopeful note with what I think is a little bit more of a, of a disruptive um, feminist approach to the problem. So I'm gonna go ahead and share some slides. Okay, so I'll start with the, the first example, which is the move to ban sex robots. More than almost any other kind of robot with the exception perhaps of um, lethal autonomous weapons or killer robots, sex robots seem to raise the question of the ethical relation between subject and object using pleasure and pain and empathy. So here I'll focus on the campaign against sex robots, which was launched in 2015 to draw attention to the new ways in which the idea of forming relationships with machines is becoming increasingly normalized in today's culture. According to the organization, quote, sex robots are animatronic humanoid dolls with penetrable orifices where consumers are encouraged to look upon these dolls as substitutes for women. At a time when pornography, prostitution, and child exploitation are facilitated and proliferated by digital technology, these products further promote the objectification of the female body, end quote. So this campaign revives and recalls the anti-pornography feminism and sex wars of the 70s and the 80s. Um, and in this case, it criminalizes both technology and potential users of technology for perpetuating male dominance and bias through representations, robotic representations of women and girls. But what's interesting is that sex robots don't really yet exist, except in science fiction and sensational media coverage. In a 2018 policy report, the campaign against sex robots acknowledged that sex dolls enhanced with artificial intelligence or sex robots are not currently commonplace. But in, report, in the report, they talk about how this fantasy of the sex robot rather than the sex robot itself poses an existential threat to women and girls. So the campaign insists that an ethical feminist politics today takes the form of a ban on particular categories of future technologies. Quote, we propose to ban the production and sale of all sex dolls and sex robots in the UK with a move to campaign for a European ban. Regulation is not the answer in this domain due to the intimate connection between misogyny and male violence. Therefore, objects that further reinforce the idea that women are programmable property can only destabilize society further, end quote. So crucially, like other manifestations of carceral feminism, the proposed ban on sex robots tethers protectable womanhood to racializing di discourse. First, and um, this is more implicit in the campaign, the universalization of the category of woman and the fear of women being treated as property appropriates for unmarked or white womanhood, the violent sexual history of chattel slavery in the Americas or colonialism and imperialism across the globe. Second, and more explicitly, the campaign racializes um, so-called patriarchal cultures, breeding pathologized desires um, and anti-feminism in the technological realm. And so this quote here, from one of their um, policy reports, um, which I'll read from just a bit, talks about how the rise of sex dolls uh, can't be disassociated from porn or worldwide misogyny, femicide, sex trafficking. And then it turns to China and talking about how in China specifically, there is an existential threat to um, women and girls because of the one child policy um, and it talks about um, also Japan. And so it specifically roots sort of the desire for sex dolls or sex robots 
to East Asia conflates it with sex trafficking. So in addition to pathologizing Chinese and Japanese masculinity, the techno-orientalism of this policy paper gestures towards Asian sexual perversity seeping into the US and um, in, into Western Europe through technology. So these um, racialized biases are kind of traveling then into the US, almost infecting um, sort of the fantasies and imaginaries. Um, and so it's um, no coincidence then with this conflation with sex trafficking that the proposed ban on sex robots very quickly pivots to the realm of human rights as a locus of justice in which women's human rights are opposed not just to robot rights, but to the existence of techno objects that are imagined to always end in a gendered unethical relation. And in this move, the category of woman stands for universal humanity and reaffirms Anglo-US liberal jurisprudence as the locus of the ethical relation, a fix for male bias. And as the campaign against sex robots puts it, robot ethics should not be about robots, but about humanity, quote, we are not proposing to extend rights to robots. We propose instead that robots are a product of human consciousness and creativity and human power relationships are reflected in the production, design and proposed uses of the robots. And this is true enough, of course, yet the proposed ban in its feminist liberal humanism imagines that a juridical ban will solve inequality. This formulation deflects from how the human itself um, a figure that the movement to ban robots leaves on, uh, sex robots leaves unquestioned is an ongoing project of racial engineering emerging from a violent racial and sexual um, encounters and conquest. And so this is something that Kalindi and I um, explored in our book, Surrogate Humanity. But moreover, the consolidation of the self-possessed individual is based on the racialized and gendered violence of the law. Building on Cheryl Harris's groundbreaking theorization of whiteness as property that, that is enshrined um, and perpetuated in US law, Brenna Bondar has recently argued that racial subordination and laws that attribute lesser legal status to slaves and Native Americans defined property in relation to the status of white people as full legal citizens. Thus, the relationship between being and having, or ontology and property ownership, animates modern theories of citizenship and law. The treatment of people as objects of ownership through the institution of slavery calls our attention to the relationship between property as a legal form and the formation of an ontology that is, in essence, racial. So attending to this um, problematic of self-possession property and use in robotics um, through the imaginary of a um, proliferation of sex with robots, Adam Rogers in this article that um, he wrote for Wired points out how this plays out in what he calls squishy ethics in the technological relation. So he writes, on the one hand, technology isn't sophisticated enough to build a sentient autonomous agent that can choose to not only have sex, but even love which means that by definition, it cannot consent. And if technology gets good enough to evince love and lust, but its programming still means that it can't consent, well, that's slavery. Um, part of consent is understanding context and one possible future here will include economic incentives for hiding context. Just as social networks hide the ways they keep people coming back for more, so too will sex devices conceal the sophisticated mach machine learning artifice that makes them able to improve, anticipate desires, augment the skills. The makers of these devices will train them on databases of hundreds of thousands of people's preferences, presumably. It's hard to consent if you don't know to whom or what you're consenting, the corporation, the other people on the network, the programmer, the algorithm. And there's a lot here, um, but I want to focus on um, the um, contract relation and the plasticity of consent vis-a-vis -vis technology that comes out here. Is the technology property or do human users become property through their use of technology as data is extracted? 
The reference to slavery here returns back in a way to the fear of becoming property that the campaign against sex robots talks about, um, where they talk about women and programmable property. And it reiterates the racialized um, property and contract relation, since in the dystopic vision is one in which the autonomous human subject unwittingly becomes property, no longer able to consent. Um, and here, the ref it's explicitly compared to slavery. So in other words, there's a profoundly racialized aspect to the fear of objectification or becoming property um, that's left unvoiced in some ways in this piece, but also in the, in the campaign against sex robots. So I want to very briefly turn to the second proposed solution um, for how AI and robotics might um, not perpetuate as much bias, which is um, the call to diversify tech and AI um, and robotics. And in surrogate humanity, as Kalindi mentioned, we define techno-liberalism as a technological politics for how difference is organized via technology's management and use of categories of race, sex, gender, and sexuality within a fantasy of a technologically enabled post-racial future. And one example that I'll give is um, Bina48, a chatbot that has been celebrated for bringing diversity into AI. The robot has been variously introduced as a college graduate, a civil rights activist and a humanoid robot. Bina48 is the brainchild of Martine Rothblatt, tech billionaire and founder of Sirius Radio and various other tech startups. So this chatbot's face and torso are constructed with motors um, that allow Bina48 to, Bina to express facial gestures. There's programming and AI algorithms and internet connectivity so that there can be an interaction between Bina48 um, and various uh, uh, potential uh, uh, users, interactants. The robot also has built-in microphones, video cameras, and face recognition software to remember frequent visitors. So Bina48 is modeled on uh, Martine's wife, Bina Rothblad, and was created to store Bina's memory and personality to extend human life um, by turning it into data and housing individual consciousness in robotic form. And what's interesting to me in this context is the techno-liberal celebration of Bina48 as um, the embodiment of liberalism capacity to encompass and enfold various kinds of differences into capitalist relations. So here is how um, CBS News tells the story of Bina48, quote, Martine Rothblatt was born Martin Rothblatt. In the middle of the night, some 30 years ago, he told his wife, Bina, he wanted to change his gender. Bina was supportive, but things didn't go over as smoothly in the business world. There were business associates who would have nothing further to do with me, Martine said, but Martine has always been a great entrepreneur. So there's really no obstacle too big or too small for her. And now Martine Rothblatt is tackling, taking on the biggest challenge of all, the limits of human life, end quote. So in this account, um, technologically driven business acumen overcomes all limits of biological humanity, enhances human potential through techno-scientific solutions. Indeed, technoscience is even posited as the answer to bigotry and prejudice, including transphobia and racism. Yet, when the artist Stephanie Dinkins interacted with Bina48 and asked the robot whether uh, Bina48 had experienced racism, Bina48 replies about experiencing racism, quote, I actually didn't have it. So the concept of racism is lacking in the programming as is clear um, in the grammatically awkward response that it's not something conceptually um, that, the, that the chat bot can, can talk about. And so in some ways in this instance, um, blackness is abstracted and commodified um, both in, in terms of its celebration of the tech industry, um, but also in the sense of uh, the wealthy few working towards extending their own lives and the functionality of their racialized um, support structures into the indefinite future. So I'll turn to my final example, um, an artistic rendering of feminist 
intelligence that um, in a way rejects the notion of a perfect AI as being either objective or unbiased. And this is the, the project by artist Lauren McCarthy titled Lauren AI. McCarthy orchestrated a series of performances as a human AI called Lauren AI, Get Lauren. The artist states, I attempt to become a human version of Amazon Alexa, a smart home intelligence for people in their own homes. The performance lasts up to a week. It begins with an installation of a series of custom designed network smart devices, including cameras, microphones, um, switches, door locks, um, faucets, and other electronic devices. I then remotely watch over the person 24 seven and control all aspects of their home. I aim to be better than an AI because I can understand them as a person and anticipate their needs. The relationship that emerges falls in the ambiguous space between human machine and human human. And I want to show you um, some of the testimonials from Lauren's clients. Laura, are my car keys? Lauren knows that I like it a little bit cooler than Miriam does. You know, I'm usually the one that does all these little extra things. So at first I was a little bit um, careful about asking her and now it's like, how else can we live? <laughs> Lauren has recommended that I get a haircut every three weeks. And let me tell you, it's helped with my, uh, my self-esteem a lot. I am able to simply approach and carry on conversations with the opposite sex, where at one point or another, that wasn't so easy. Lauren, we're right at toothpaste. Lauren would know what I want, but then maybe it's not what I really want internally. But externally, she thinks that play, um, Lauren thinks that playing music or shutting down all my electronics is the best way for me to cope and winding down when maybe it's not. Lauren was actually able to help, help her manage her medication um, and take her medication on time. And everything actually got a lot better after that. You have those friends who are kind of about you, like the friendship is about you. That's what Lauren is like. It's like a roommate, it's a friend but we're always talking about me. It's always about me, whatever it is. But it's a real person and it's going, and Lauren, Lauren is a real person and Lauren's been through perhaps what I've been through. And then I forget that she's around, even though she's kind of always around or I assume she's always around. And, um, and then I'll remember she's there and I wonder if my hair looks okay. And then I can check in. I don't really like the idea of Lauren being in control. Um, I like the idea of her being in support, but not in control. On one hand, I'm, I'm perfectly fine having Lauren around and, and it's become... Oh. So, as you can see here, um, Lauren is in some ways the, the, um, the opposite of what um, Kalindi and I wrote about in Surrogate Humanity um, as the history of what counts as a, as a good AI. So um, rational, objective, and not about aesthetic judgments. Um, so Lauren uh, posits as intelligence um, that which would not count as advancement. Um, as um, the artist writes about, she talks about needing to sleep, being only able to be with one client at a time. Unlike Alexa, the home assistant upon which um, McCarthy modeled her own uh, performance, the users of Lauren AI, as you heard in these testimonials, are aware that they're interacting with a human being, um, even as that human being is acting as a technology. This makes them contemplate the possessive use relationship, marking who is the subject and who is the object with, for at least some of them, some amount of unease. 
Um, so we um, did uh, hear um, that um, interactions with Lauren are always about me, um, but that isn't something that one would necessarily contemplate if one is interacting with like a Siri or an Alexa. And then there's also a kind of fear that comes with that. So toward the end of the clip that I played, we we'll see the woman in the white pants um, saying that she likes the idea of Lauren being in support, but not in control. After all, the main premise of social robots and AI assistance um, meant for the home is that they obey, as Clindy and I wrote about in our book, human users' desires and command. Um, commands. Um, this is a fantasy, uh, a racial and colonial fantasy of total domination. Um, this is precisely why Lauren's present absence or absent presence as a human AI feels, as a Guardian article described it, creepy. Um, so the, 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 the service function is made quite explicit. Yet toward the end of the testimonial video, there's an increased emphasis on what makes Lauren better than a machine AI. With no pre-programming, intuition can step in. This is a shift away from the rational and the efficient in what is valued as intelligence. In fact, as McCarthy has stated, her clients were also really aware that she was human, so they were patient. Quote, I was much slower. Some of them told me they felt bad about asking me to do things. McCarthy um, also had to, as I mentioned, see to biological functions, including sleeping um, and um, taking her laptop to the bathroom. So unlike the, the, the model of the ban or the model of a simple um, representational inclusion, there's something here about the disruption um, in relations that I think could do really interesting um, work. And so I will end there. And I'm looking forward to the conversation that we're gonna have. So uh, the questions are beginning to come in. I have one from uh, an anonymous attendee. What is the role of today's commons, in quote, in shaping AI? Should the onus be on the AI designer exclusively, or do we, those interactants, recipients, users of the AI, have a responsibility to disrupt and even destroy AI after its, their initial conception, creation, distribution? This is where Nada and I can't make eye contact to see who's gonna answer first. You want me to go first? Um, well, it's a, Interesting um, use of the word commons. So I don't know if people in the audience are familiar with the Google Twitter bot, the Tay Twitter bot. Um, so it was a machine learning program that had a Twitter profile and would interact with people on Twitter based on an algorithm. And because it was a learning machine, it would change its understanding of the world based on its interactions with people. So what happened is a bunch of trolls kind of took over and within 24 hours, the Twitter bot was only able to say things that were genocidal, racist, misogynist, violent. So this question of like, what is the role of the commons in shaping AI is really, I don't think we can know because the commons isn't interacting with, a, there's not like an AI and a commons that are interacting with one another. It's all these kind of, um, specific platforms, really contextualize interactions with technology and really specific populations that are interacting with them. So, and another example people often cite is that um, some of our technologies like apps in particular don't receive any social impact oversight. So we just put them on our phones, they're still in beta, we start using them, they become part of our lives, like Lauren, right? They said, how did we do anything before we had Lauren in our home? So that's like the Uber app, everyone was using it. And then, you know, it was already part of infrastructure before it had even been really clearly designed or before there was a clear intention behind um, what it would do or an assessment of the impact. So. I guess I would say, yes, we all have a responsibility to disrupt and even destroy AI. Actually, Nada and I talked to a sort of gray hat 
programmer um, when we were doing some research in Germany who said, you know, when changing the technology fails, then just break it. So that's one kind of philosophy um, of what to do about the problem. But, um, you know, I do think as an educator, there are other solutions. And that's one of the things I was talking about in my presentation, which is we hope, I know Nada and I hope that by educating people in the histories that we know and allowing them to bring that to their designs, they'll actually have a different understanding of what the social impact could be and where what seems like their innovative ideas, what the history is of where those are coming from, like what exactly are they building on? Did you want to add, Nita? Yeah, I also always remember that conversation we had in Germany about the response, what this person talked about is the responsibility to hack. And I've always found that really interesting. Um, there's um, been so much talk about the, um, you know, the, the ring doorbell cameras um, recently and the sidewalk project. But, um, but before that, uh, about a year or two ago, these documents were leaked about all of the times that the um, ring um, cameras have been have been hacked and where people give warnings to each other when the police are coming and things like that. So it's so I think there's there's there are definitely multiple ways of using technology, but I think that being conscious about how we use technology is important. But at the same time, I think it is crucial to recognize how much we rely on technology. I often I think about what would have happened this pandemic year um, without Zoom. Before the pandemic happened, um, UC Santa Cruz grad students were on strike. Um, and there was talk of fa faculty not using Zoom because of the surveillance of Zoom. Um, but so much of what happened this past year, including the work of education, couldn't have um, happened. So it's 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 a kind of um, you know it's it's a very complicated um, complicated question and an important one. I have another question. Ellen asks, "Have you ever heard of Open Cog?" Do you have any knowledge of what people are actually trying to do about these issues? Um, also adds, uh, do you know about Julia Mossbridge's work? Are you looking okay. at me, Nada? <laughs> um, I don't, I just typed back that I don't, but I'll look into it. Um, I I think I I remember hearing about Open Cog. I think um, it's part, if I'm remembering correctly, it's part of a sort of open, Cooperatism, cooperativism, open source kind of modeled um, machine learning platform. I could be wrong about that, but I can say, um, you know, I think it's a good reminder that people have been trying to think of ways to organize technology design against on the scale of big tech um, without absorbing their values. And so open cooperativism is the movement that I know most about. So that kind of brings together the digital politics of open source, the freedom of information kind of movement with what is a more materialist history of cooperativism, which, you know, someone mentioned the commons earlier. So cooperativism in the sense of shared labor, shared resources. And so um, open cooperativism is um and i'm happy to follow up with people afterward you know embraces commons based peer production as opposed to like what nita and i write about in our book which is this fantasy of the sharing economy where you know one company or two companies controls all the material that um we're using um to sort of create our sharing uh, and then they skim off a profit and they also advertise to us through the same um, app. So um, yeah, that's one of the things that people are doing and I think it must be, you know, related to open cog. And um, there are other things too, you know, if we had more time, I could share more examples of things that roboticists have done. Nita and I both observed, you know, in the course of our research that most of the kind of protesting or dissident technologies are small scale there you know there's one or two maybe kind of like the lauren project and they're people they're the designers are people who left engineering or robotics to enter the art world where there's not the profit 
I mean, it, arguably there is a profit motive, but um, there's not the same kind of corporate profit motive behind driving their their innovation and their imagination. So um, that's one place that we're seeing some kind of conceptual challenges. Yeah, I think that's great. And I'll just add to that um, there, I, I think there, I, I mean, I talked about property in, in relation to, to um, to, to the question of use and the fear of becoming property in relation to technology. But I think there's important conversations to be had about the history of intellectual property um, that is underlying so much of um, big tech's um, gains in, in, in opposition to the, to the kind of um, open source um, uh, movements that, that Kalindi was discussing. Um, but yeah, I, I, I also just want to second what Kalindi said, which is that we found that the moment people start making objects that aren't um, very immediately useful or very immediately about improving efficiency, um, they or or not or it's not even clear how to use them or they're programmed to stop functioning, um, they they become art. They no longer become sort of anything that that is considered. Um, technology as such. Um, so yeah. Wade asks, what kind of regulatory framework of oversight slash participation do you recommend governments take? Can diplomacy play a role in helping shape this conversation? I am just going to say that Nada well, I'll just speak for myself. Um, I don't give policy recommendations, but I can say that um, as Nada was talking about in her presentation, the idea of bans or, you know, of, of bad technologies and good technologies doesn't work um, for many, many reasons. And I think that what has been more successful are programs that look at social impact from the very um, inception of a project. So before you even got a concept idea um, before you get to the you know first page of designing the research um, actually collaborating with people who understand social impact seems to be more um, successful than these kind of formal mechanisms of um, institutional review ethics review um, and I'm I'm not I'm sure diplomacy can always play a role in helping everything but I'm not sure I understand that part of the question unfortunately yeah, I, I I completely I completely agree with what Kalindi said, um, and I would just add that I I've been very happy over the last few years to see so many more collaborations between engineers, humanists, and social scientists um, at the level of various universities, but also across. Um, uh, fields. Um, and I think that these are the kinds of collaborations that can actually allow for a, a sort of thought process um, on social impact that are that's much more meaningful um, than regulation or oversight, because that regulation and that oversight, at least in the US context, would be happening in a state whose interest is to um, support the engine of capitalist growth to which the tech industry is, um, you know, is essential. So um, I'll just that, yeah. <laughs> and Catalin asks, uh, this is um, aimed towards Nita regarding the Lauren AI clip. Can you talk a bit about how were those clips filmed or put together? Stylistically, they seem quite intriguing and unlike anything that I've seen before. So, um, so as I mentioned, my understanding is that the artist set up cameras and microphones, and they must have built, been um, wide angle in in the homes, um, and was observing it through the through the laptop and interacting with, and and people could go when the project was happening. People could go and and sign up for it. 
I mean, I personally wouldn't have, but people could go, I get the guy who needed help with his hair so he could date. Um, <laughs> and, and, and then that, and that, that was the interaction. So, so it was recorded. Um, uh, and, and then sort of uh, that became the, that became the project. Um, that, that's my understanding of it, of it at least. Okay. Um, another anonymous attendee asks, what is the difference between a feminist approach and feminist disruption? Approach was my nice, nice way of saying uh, sort of uh, approaches that I think don't work. Um, in fact, maybe don't necessarily even match up with um, my particular understanding of feminism. Um, you know, when, when in Surrogate Humanity, Kalindi and I talked about how um, it was really the, it was really the project that made us think about human, human and human machine relations differently than we're accustomed to that were that were ones that were really interesting that had the 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 the, the potential to redescribe um, what we know as who is human how they get to be human um, what you know what or who is property um, subject object relationships and so I was really interested in the in the Lauren project and called it disruptive because. Um, you know, she talks about blurring that boundary between human human and human machine relations that is really interesting. Um, you know, at the same time, we could obviously talk about, um, you know, uh, could a male presenting artist have performed the Siri or Alexa role, right? Um, in some ways, it, it you know, it, it, the performance works because it does um, gesture towards that kind of femi feminized uh, secretarial wifely support role. Um, but also the fact that so many um, critics called it creepy, I think is, is significant. And, and it's that creepiness that makes us think about something differently or like, oh, maybe my interaction with Alexa is creepy. Yes, it's creepy. <laughs> Everything is being recorded. <laughs> at all times. So, um, so that, that's what I meant about disruptive, because I, I'm not sure at this point that it's possible for a single approach to overturn this entire infrastructure that we're living with. Um, but to disrupt it here and there, I think is, is important. Kalindi, did you have a... Well, I, I do think that question was directed to Nada because she used those terms. But I actually use the idea of feminist approach when I'm speaking with people in the sciences and in engineering to talk about research design. So what's the difference between just your approach that you were taught you know, in your training and adding a feminist approach? And the idea there is to center an analysis of power and hierarchy in what you're doing. So even if, you know, as one engineer said to me, there's no politics in my work, I just work with the laws of physics, um, you can uh, think about your approach to the, the outcome you want, to the process of the research in terms of power and hierarchy, and then you have a feminist approach. And I there are lots of excellent examples of feminist disruptions. I think it's what we do best, but... Um, that's my idea of feminist approach. Well, on that note, we have just about run out of time. I really would like to thank both of you. This has been really such a rich discussion and presentations have been fantastic. I'm so grateful that you could join us and be part of this. Um, I'd like to also remind everyone, we have posted links in the chat function with which you can buy books. Uh, also, if you'd like to connect with the authors, if you have any final you know, thoughts, questions, now is a very good time to post them while I'm going to talk a little bit about our next session, which will be taking place tomorrow at 10 a.m. It's going to be Jonathan Beller and uh, Gary O'Bannon. Their presentation is called Economic Media for the Decolonization of Money. Uh, hoping you'll join us for that. Also, um, you know, there are many, many other events and workshops lined up. So please check out the uh, Revisions web portal, uh, check out the calendar, do register for events. Uh, today's talk is going to be rebroadcast on the Gray Area website. So if you know anyone who missed it, 
or if you'd like to watch it again, um, you know, please access that. So this event was sponsored by the City Lights Foundation. It's a 501c nonprofit carrying on the legacy of our founder, the late Lawrence Ferlinghetti. City Lights Foundation fosters an active engagement with books and literary culture. Our public events, publishing program, and educational outreach are dedicated to sustaining a vibrant community of readers, writers, and independent thinkers. So once again, thank you all. Um, this has been such a great pleasure. Kalindi, Nita, thank you again. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It was such a pleasure.